In the previous programme, we looked back at the first five years of the Borders Railway. There's a lot of excitement with regards to the future. There are calls to see the line extended through Hoyk all the way to Carlisle. Some would rather see the line go east to join up at Berwick-upon-Tweed. But in this episode, we'll be asking how realistic the prospect of an extension is. Let's begin with a chat with David Parker, a big player in getting the Borders Railway to where it is now. He's convener of the Scottish Borders Council, and when I met up with him recently, he was delighted to announce that the line would be electrified, and it could happen within five years. Well, the good news is that the Scottish Government have committed to decarbonising the Borders Railway. And what that means, in effect, is that the lines will electrify the railway its whole length between Tweedbank and Edinburgh, or they'll introduce partial electrification with battery-operated trains. And the good news about that is it'll make the railway much greener, it will certainly help in relation to uh, making the railway more on time and more efficient, and it will in- introduce a uh, brand new rolling stock, which will be much more comfortable, much more quiet, and certainly significantly more environmentally friendly. So there's huge cause for optimism about this investment and the work that they're going to do to make sure that the Borders Railway is decarbonised. I think it could be done within five years. The, the Scottish Government last summer committed to a decarbonisation plan for all of Scotland railways by 2035. And although they didn't put timescales on individual projects in that document, it's very clear from the document that they're working on individual projects, Borders Railway being one of them, which is being worked on right now. So there's no reason why it can't be delivered in a five to six year time scale. And certainly all the mood music I'm hearing from Network Rail it suggests that there's real opportunity and real optimism about the delivery of the project. Remember, Borders was built to allow electrification to become a reality at a future point in time. So in theory, making this uh, this line electrified and introducing a decarbonisation is relatively straightforward because much of the investment has already been made. But one option would be to electrify the line partially and then run battery trains on the bit that isn't electrified. And that's very much a possibility and one that I think Network Rail and Transport Scotland will want to exhaust. Battery trains are are, are as straightforward as they sound. In effect, you have a a new piece of rolling stock, a train with a a large-scale battery in it, and you have partial electrification to allow those batteries to be charged. So, a project like the Borders Railway, you might electrify from Tweed Bank to north of Gala Shields, and the train would run on the electrification whilst it charges its battery. It would then operate on the battery, say, to Midlovian, and then it would go back onto an electrical network to recharge the battery again and to go into Edinburgh. And, of course, there's charging points at the the various different stations for the battery technology and the attraction of the Borders Railway is that half of the infrastructure costs have already been invested and they were invested when the line was built because it was built with electrification in mind and that's why it'll be a relatively straightforward and easy project to deliver. If the Waverley route does get reconnected between Scotland and England the hope is that tourism will receive a huge boost. It opens up possibilities for more special chartered steam trains to come into the borders. And as we've seen already, crowds flock to see these magnificent machines.
Events such as common ridings and rugby sevens and attractions including Abbotsford House, Melrose Abbey, the Liederfurt Viaduct and more would be more accessible to tourists who would be able to enjoy the border's culture. Heritage operator Richard Morris is excited about the prospect of tourism getting a much needed boost. We have a scheduled first class train that is ferrying people backwards and forwards between Appleby, which is maybe 25-30 miles from Carlisle, and down to Skipton in North Yorkshire. And this is proving a real success. We're tapping a new tourist market middle range. It's not the steam specials where you pay £200 for premier dining. It's people who are prepared to pay £30, £40, £50 and travel this wonderful line of ours uh, in, in luxury. And that's a real success, first time ever. We could do exactly the same, I think, with the reopened Waverley line and it would be really beneficial to communities along the way. Simon Kerr was in charge of the track laying team who walked the length of the Borders Railway to deliver the line. And he said he'd be very happy if he was called on to assemble another team to continue the journey south of Tweedbank when reflecting back on the time in 2015 when his colleagues came from Edinburgh into the Scottish Borders. We were two years in the planning before we started delivering. Um, a lot of thought went into it, but new processes working closely with the Dutch and on their, their actually the, the LRU machine, long rail unit, um, how the actual rails came off, how many we could deliver at a time, how many trains were required, uh, what, would, what was our, our, uh, our recovery plan if anything did go wrong. Most other jobs were seen as a nuisance, making noise, um, being a bit, of, a bit of a harassment to the, the travelling public. This job um, completely different. Every single day there was someone somewhere with a camera, a video camera, um, some of the lineside neighbours were actually offering us cups of tea and coffee, which was, was unique. I've never ever heard that anywhere else before on the railway. I had to learn um, new loading uh, manuals uh, for the safe delivery of the, ra the rails to site. Um, the guys on the deck working with the machine, they had to learn all how it worked before we even started. We had a couple of trial runs to make sure everyone was happy and we weren't requiring any additional um, training. Everything went well. The high point was getting to here. Um, just an emotional burst just when we got to here. It was a huge big cheer went up. Um, it was a remarkable achievement. If I had a magic wand I would go with stage two, yes. I would love to push on. Um, unfortunately that's out with my pay band. Managing Director of Scotland's Railway is Alex Hines, a man who's very optimistic about the future, particularly with the upcoming electrification and decarbonisation across the entire network. I think that the future clearly is electric, not just because of decarbonisation, but also because of growth, because we have diesel trains on the Borders Railway and no one's building diesel trains anymore. We certainly don't want to be ordering any more diesel trains. So uh, electrifying the railway won't just decarbonise the borders, it will also give us additional rolling stock for this growth that we're seeing. Clearly we need to make sure we're providing a boringly reliable service so that it's a service on which people can depend and we also need to make sure we're providing extra carriages on those services that operate. And the good news is that as we get more intercity trains here in Scotland for the long distance routes we can do what's called an internal cascade so we can operate more carriages on the Borders Railway so six carriage trains in the peak uh, vis-a-vis -vis five years ago when we launched the railway we're operating two carriage trains and that just shows you the growth that we're seeing. Given that it's been such a success Tweedbank to Edinburgh uh, we'd love to see it extended further south clearly that's a matter for UK and Scottish governments and it's been good to see some encouraging noises recently uh, in this respect.
clearly uh, railway projects are uh, very expensive, reassuringly expensive. Uh, in an ideal world, anything we build would have passive provision for future growth. As I say, this is a matter for UK and Scottish governments, but you're right to raise the point around resilience, uh, having another Anglo-Scot route, but also the fact that both West Coast Mainline and East Coast Mainline are filling up. We've got more operators wanting to run on the East Coast Mainline, for example, and as we know, that double-track railway uh, to the south of here is actually quite full, so much so that it's a bit of a squeeze to put the train service in for the new stations that we're going to build on the East Coast Main Line here in Scotland. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a positive story of growth and we need to continue working with the UK government and the Scottish government on making the case for more investment in railway projects. Rail expert and author David Spaven has been a keen observer of the Borders Railway and has a cautious approach to the future. I think this question of passenger forecasting lies at the heart of what we should learn for the future. Really, for the sake of pushing on to Hoyt, for the sake of other railways in Scotland that might be reopened, we really need to look at that forecasting and try and get it right in light of the border railway experience. I certainly think that new and more realistic ways of forecasting you know, should strengthen the case to push on to Hoyt and possibly even Carlisle. I think the, the difficulty is at the moment we've got our railway to Galashiels and Tweed Bank that people in Hoyt can benefit from already either by driving to the park and ride site at Tweed Bank or catching the X95 bus up to the, the superb new interchange in Gala and then swapping onto the, onto the train. Uh, so people are already getting some benefit from the railway in Hoyt. If we push on the 18 miles to Hoyt, you've got all the costs of getting there. And it's, it's not easy in places through Melrose and St Boswell, so we've got all the costs, but we don't get all the benefits we'd have got if it had gone to Hoyt in the first place, which, of course, it really should have done, because Hoyt's the town which has suffered most from the loss of the Waverley route back in 1969. So I think it's, it's, it's difficult, but, you know, we've got a climate change emergency. If that's going to mean anything, then we have to invest more in public transport. We know that the railway, if it's built the right way, is more reliable than road transport. It's more sustainable. Um, there are question marks to do with the coronavirus pandemic and what the impact of that will be. So it's difficult to have a crystal ball. But you, you have to say that Hoyk should be part of the ScotRail network. To my mind, part of the equation has to be timber traffic from south of Hoyk. That's what almost got the railway reopened back in the 1990s, but for a downturn in the timber market. And I think getting heavy timber traffic off roads through the likes of Newcastleton, etc., uh, I, I think there's a very strong policy benefit in there. And I think that would really help to make the case. But others have argued, you know, through trains from Edinburgh to Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, running through the borders, picking up at Gala, Melrose, St Boswells and Hoyt. That's an important strand. And, and I can see that. Um, I just don't think it's going to be easy. But then again, getting the railway to Tweedbank wasn't easy. It took us 20 years. Chair of the Campaign for Borders Rail is Simon Walton. The work done behind the scenes by the campaign is one of the reasons why we have a Borders Railway at the moment. But they won't rest until they see the old Waverley route reconnected all the way to Carlisle. There will be challenges of course and the first hurdle to overcome will be getting from Tweedbank through Melrose. There's an Edinburgh bypass that's been overcome, there's a Dalkeith bypass that's been overcome, there will be a Melrose bypass that will be overcome. It's a road, it was built over the railway, it can be moved out of the way of the railway. There's still room to bring a railway through here. This compromise has to be made, and that's all it takes, a little bit of compromise. Going back to the station again, we've seen at Esk Bank, the old platform is still there, it's overgrown, but it's just a few yards further down the track. Uh, do you think they might build the new Melrose station almost next to this one? If it better serves the community, yes, but I would argue that this station is best placed to do that. It's best placed to serve the community, it's best placed as a, well, a, a stone-built ambassador for the community. Well, Simon, we've moved over to Stobbs, a place with a dark history. It is, yeah. Can you imagine um, in the, um, the First World War, 14 to 18, being here? There'd be 20,000 
prisoners of war here. And all of them being decamped just down the hill there at Stobb Station, a, a tiny little hamlet it was built to serve. And uh, it was open for the whole duration of the Borders Union Railway, uh, but that was its busiest time. And you can see behind me here the, uh, the old telegraph office, where remarkably actually German prisoners were allowed to send messages back to their families. It was a, a different time back then. Of course, some of the um, the bridges and the structures are still here, and including the one at Stobbs. Very similar to the, the viaducts which crossed the rivers in Hoek and which were unfortunately um, demolished. They will have to be replaced. Let's be thankful that the one here at Stobbs and the very much grander affair at Shank End is still extant, um, because without them it would be a very much more difficult job to re-establish the line through Hoek and onto Carlisle. Patron of the Campaign for Borders Rail is television presenter, engineer and rail enthusiast Rob Bell. And he was delighted to put his hand up and add his weight of support to the project. He also sees a host of benefits to the area. For me, the excitement of the prospect of the Borders Rail being extended all the way through to Carlisle comes from two very simple things. Firstly, I'm a big fan of rail travel anyway. But secondly, as far as I've understood it, that the benefits that have already been felt by the communities on the existing Borders Rail would be spread all the way along the Borders region through to Carlisle if it were to be extended, which I cannot help but think would be a great thing for those communities. Communities both on the route itself and further afield. Communities around the route. If the Borders Railway were to be extended, it would connect even more people and families. It would connect even more businesses. And I feel like it would bring a real focus of interest and activity into one shared project across the region that would attract people to get involved from all interests, all backgrounds, all trades of all ages as well. I fully understand that constructing a railway is an enormous undertaking, fraught with all sorts of challenges financial challenges, environmental challenges, political challenges, and most interestingly for me, technical, engineering challenges. But we know it can be done. It was done back in the 19th century. And there's a real opportunity here to bring a new generation of engineers into the railway industry. And hopefully many of those involved in the project, if it were to be extended, would come from the Borders region. Other routes have been talked about, taking the Waverley route through to Langham, for instance, rather than Newcastleton, or even ditching the Waverley route and going to Berwick-upon-Tweed. Of course, the Waverley route main line, which is what we're concentrating on, and it is the campaign's preferred option that the, the main line be reinstated between Edinburgh, Midlothian, the Borders and Carlisle. Now, there were many other lines a whole web indeed of lines which came off that and served every significant community in the borders, including those that have just been mentioned. And there was a line which went um, across to the East Coast and joined uh, the East Coast main line. Now, we're suggesting that in the first instance, we should look at that main line, re-establishing that as the spine of an integrated public transport network for the entire borders. And the reason being, it was the main line, it was the most direct route, it served the most populous parts of the borders and it provides the best and most direct route to reintegrate with the national network. And that really is the overall benefit of a, a re-established Borders Railway and Waverley route. It will be fundamentally a great asset for the entire national network. The line has to be reinstated because that's the best and most tangible way to get the borders back on the map, to get the borders reconnected, to give opportunities to generations coming that there are places to work and places to live in the borders. It's a place to raise families, it's a place to make your life for generations to come. What we're doing now with the Borders Railway and the campaign to extend it is leaving a legacy that will be around for a hundred years. I spoke with David Parker in the previous programme when he gave me his assessment of the first five years of the Borders Railway. But it was clear that he wasn't entirely comfortable about the lack of progress in extending the track south of Tweedbank. 
When you go beyond Tweedbank, you've got 60 odd miles plus to go. You have a whole raft of engineering challenge. This will be a billion pounds plus project. It's going to be a very sizable and significant costly project. And although it can absolutely happen technically, and I believe it can be delivered, somebody somewhere is going to have to argue and secure the funding for that project. And they're going to be competing against a range of other projects in both countries. So there's a lot of work to be done before it's a reality and before that funding is in place. And it's a sizable element of funding that it needs. Okay, we're into our time capsule. We go forward 20 years. Here we are again at Tweedbank Station. What are we seeing in the borders as far as trains are concerned? I think if we're lucky, I think if we're very lucky and the momentum picks up and, and there is a genuine willingness and more money becomes available, we might be at the very beginning of construction of the extension. That's quite a shock, isn't it? Because we were thinking maybe 10 years' time we'd be at least seeing uh, some work going on. If you'd asked me that question when we stood here in September um, uh, uh, September 2015, I, at that point I would have said, with a fair wind, 10 years. I think given the fact it's taken five years to do the feasibility study, the, the challenges of COVID and just the lack of momentum and you know the big issue around the funding of it, I, I think you know the, the very best I could offer would be 20 years from now, we might be starting its construction. But an awful lot of very positive things have to develop to make that a reality. If it's going to happen, this project's now got to gain the same amount of momentum that it had when the project was being delivered in its first phase. Well, you went on record just over a year ago saying you were 100% certain of its return. What percentage are you on now? I'm still 100% certain, and if I could be more than 100% certain, I would be. The climate has changed in favour of extending this railway. It makes sense economically, it makes sense socially, it makes sense environmentally. I'm absolutely convinced, as I always have been, that this will not be the end of the line. We will see this line extended through Hoek and onto Carlisle.